All right, first take of my graduation lecture. I apologize for the whining in the background. My laptop is very old and it wheezes and the fan goes at a large distance and this is the best I can get it to sound. Um, I hope you're doing well, Beth. I'm letting it hit a round number before I start so that I can time myself better. I think I finally have a good setup. I got two computers, got the phone, and I'm ready. Here we go. Hello everyone. For anyone who hasn't managed to meet me, my name is Andrea Hawkins and I'm in writing for children and teens. Today, I'm going to talk to you about weird books. For centuries, the novel has been a sequential story told in straightforward prose. But lately, more and more authors have begun to deviate, prompting the theoretical debate over the death of the novel. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not that serious. However, experimentation in writing has gone far past the writing exercise. Today, many people consider experimental fiction to be a genre unto itself. The oldest and most common form is that of the epistolary novel, or novel in letters, and more recently documents. From Dracula to the inspiration behind the blockbuster The Martian, the epistolary novels have been around for a very long time. In fact, the first novel to be considered epistolary was published all the way back in 1495. It was called Carcel de Amor by Diego de San Pedro. So clearly, there's always been a home for the abnormal format in the world of novels. However, people started to get really crazy with the rise of the French group Olippo. Olippo is short for Ouvoir de Literature Potentielle, which translates to Workshop of Potential Literature. It was founded in 1960 by French mathematician Francois de Lyonnais and writer Raymond Quinault. They hoped to explore the possibilities of what exactly happens when literature meets constraints, and they found that it is through these kinds of experiments that creativity actually booms. I'm going to go through a few examples of Olippo's more popular constraints so you can get an idea of what they were all about. In the world of poetry, there is something called the snowball poem. Just like a snowball gathers more snow as it rolls down the hill, each line of the poem adds a letter, getting progressively longer and longer as it snowballs towards the conclusion. Let's, see, let's look at the example. I am the text which begins sparely, assuming magnitude constantly, perceptively proportional, incorporating unquestionable incrementations. This is sort of an informational poem, as you see the content describing the format. But even though it is a short poem, the lengthening effect makes it feel longer. You feel more grounded in the sense of authority that comes from the poem's gaining momentum. It feels like it's gaining confidence in itself, and it's all thanks to the format, the constraint, not the words. Similar letter constraints can include omissions of certain letters. Um, this is called a lipogram. For example, you could make a lipogram excluding the letters in your own name. Maybe try to describe yourself without the essence of you. An even more specified lipogram is called a univocalism, and that limits the writer to just one vowel. I don't recommend starting with only U. It's kind of hard. <laughs> but extended off this constraint of letters is the constraint of words. Everyone here has probably heard of the shortest story of all time. For sale. Baby shoes never worn. From just this, a whole range of questions and emotions fall. It seems simple, but things that seem simple are often the hardest to achieve. Take a look at these examples of six-word memoirs. All of them tell a story, but I'm particularly fond of this last one. Fired therapist, one mother, is enough. From just that one sentence, I can infer that the narrator has been raised by a single mother, also that this bothered them, enough to seek therapy over it. However, over time they learn to appreciate what they have in their mother and stop wishing for whatever they thought was missing in their lives. They have the confidence required to admit to no longer needing help. It's a pretty powerful narrative right there with only six words. But, perhaps Olivo's most famous writing experiment is called N plus 7. This is where you take the, every noun, the N, of a piece and replace it with the seventh noun after it in the dictionary. The result can, can often have surprising effects as a finished piece or even just providing a new and inspiring metaphor. Let's take a look at the transformation of William Blake's Tiger Tiger. We'll look at just the first stanzas for time's sake. The original first stanza reads, Tiger Tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Now, let's look at the N plus 7 version of that same stanza. 
Timber, timber, burning broad in the forgeries of the nightlight, what impertinent handful or eye-opener could fraternity thy fearful syndicate? How fortunate is it that timber is now what is burning? And that last line is now a whole new and interesting concept, that fraternity and brotherhood can be a source of fear. What new poem can be spawned from just that one line, from that one idea you may never have thought of before? Okay, so of course I know what you're thinking. It's what I thought and what every confident writer thinks. I am super creative. I can think of creative things all on my own and the blank page doesn't frighten me at all. <laughs> well, I feel you, it's true. Of course we're all very creative, it's why we're here. But studies have shown that humans are often the most creative under a constraint. An article in Wired points out that the brain is a neural tangle of near infinite possibility, which means that it spends a lot of time and energy choosing what not to notice. As a result, creativity is traded away for efficiency. We think in literal prose, not symbolist poetry, and this is why constraints are so important. It's not until we encounter an unexpected hindrance, a challenge we can't easily resolve, that the chains of cognition are loosened, giving us newfound access to the weird connections simmering in the unconscious. So essentially, constraints allow us to think outside of our linear and prose thinking. When our old tricks and relied upon language habits fail us, it is then that we are forced to seek out new possibilities, and it translates great into telling non-linear stories. So let's look back at the epistolary novels, a little bit longer than the exercises we've been looking at so far. Those who bemoan the death of the novel claim that they are inferior in a key aspect of the novel's responsibility, the representation of consciousness. A letter is criticized as too transparent, but I would argue that this transparency creates an intimacy between character and reader that is stronger than traditional prose. Letters, texts, and emails are private things between two people, and seeing them gives the reader a personal peek into the characters' lives. The first time I ever read a novel like this was Meg Cabot's Boy Next Door, and it's our first novel example. This is a quirky rom-com with an attempted murder thrown in. What makes it experimental is that it is written entirely in emails. This has quite a few benefits. The smallest, but perhaps most powerful, is the subject line of the email. Just like a real email, it can give you a hint about the plot, a plot twist or a turn of events before the events actually unfold, and it works well at continuing to hold the reader's attention. Another great advantage is that every section of the story is told from the perspective of one character directly to another. The voice is constantly shifting not only between speakers, but by the speaker's audience. Main character Mel will rant and rave to her best friend Nadine, but pull back when messaging her boss, George. The large and rotating cast of voices is expertly introduced in the beginning surrounding one event. Mel has found her neighbor passed out from an attack on the way to work and she is late. We find this out through a barrage of emails to Mel before she can finally respond. So let's look at the different angles we have, starting with the form letter from Human Resources. Subject, tardiness. Dear Melissa Fuller, this is an automated message from the Human Resources Division of the New York Journal, New York City's leading photo newspaper. Please be aware that according to your supervisor, Managing Editor George Sanchez, your work day here at the Journal begins promptly at 9 a.m., making you 68 minutes tardy today. This is your 37th tardy exceeding 20 minutes so far this year, Melissa Fuller. We in the Human Resources Department are not out to get in tardy employees, as was mentioned in last week's unfairly worded employee newsletter. And so on. Right away, the reader is introduced to the inciting incident, but not why. Why is Mel late? Clearly she's late a lot, but what makes this time different? And we know this time will be different because it's the beginning of our novel. This cheerful letter is contrasted immediately with a concerned note from Nadine. Subject line, you are in trouble. Mel, where are you? I saw that Amy Jenkins from Human Resources skulking around your cubicle. I think you're in for another one of those tardy notices. What is this, your 50th? A seemingly caring Human Resources rep is now skulking around the cubicle. It's our first hint that Amy is looking for any reason to get Mel in trouble. So then, we continue our cast with ex-boyfriend Aaron, who does not realize that yes, he was broken up with last night. Subject, last night. Where are you, Mel? Are you going to be completely childish about this and not come into the office until you're sure I've left for the day? Is that it? Can't we sit down and discuss this like adults? Aaron Spender, Senior Correspondent, New York Journal. Next we get Dolly, lovable and nosy, and calling everyone darling. Subject line, Aaron Spender. 
Melissa, don't get the wrong idea, darling. I wasn't spying on you, but a girl would have to be blind not to have noticed how you brained Aaron Spender with your bag last night. Then we get irritated boss George. Subject, where the hell are you? Where the hell are you? You appear to be under the mistaken impression that comp days don't have to be prearranged with your employer. This is not exactly convincing me you're a columnist material. More like copy edit material, Fuller. After one more nervous email from BFF Nadine, we finally hear from our protagonist as she describes finding her elderly neighbor face down this morning. Subject line, where the hell I was. Since it is apparently important to you and Amy Jenkins that your employees account fully for every moment they spend away from the office, I will provide you with a detailed summary of my whereabouts while I was unavoidably detained. Ready? Got your Mountain Dew? I hear the machine down the art department is fully operational. Followed by a list of things. So why not tell this all in prose? Of course, the huge benefit is the multiple perspectives. Not only do we see how the supporting cast fits into Mel's life, we see how they feel about her, how they talk to her. And we get introduced to several subplots, her trying to move up in the world at work, her breakup with her boyfriend, etc. This also allows with a degree of distance between the readers and the scene of the crime, as this is a lighthearted comedy after all. Along that line, all of our characters are speaking in unfiltered voices. Their spunky tongues ring through in a way that might only come out in dialogue in a normal prose piece. In a piece like this, everything is in a form of dialogue, a chance to develop and explore multiple voices, and that continues throughout the novel and only strengthens the narrative. So I am in writing for children and teens, so let's drop down to the world of teen literature and also explore a personal favorite of mine as far as experiments go, the story told in list form. I stumbled upon this fascinatingly complex novel entitled me being you, me being me, is exactly as insane as you being you. So without being too spoilery, our main character is a high schooler named Darren, whose life is thrown for a loop when his divorced father admits to him that he is gay, prompting Darren to ditch school on a bus to visit his brother with the mysterious and attractive goth girl, Zoe. So now, let's look at some of the key moments of the first half of the novel and see how the format enhances or hurts these moments. To me, Perhaps one of the most powerful lists in the novel is the lack of one. In the aftermath of Darren's father's coming out, we get this. People at school Darren feels like he could talk to about what his dad just told him. The blank page that follows says more than any amount of words that could have filled it. The author could have described Darren's pain, Darren's loneliness, Darren's emptiness, but instead he shows this. The absence on the page, this lack of words, mirrors Darren's helplessness, and not even the reader makes the list of people he can share his pain with. The format is uniquely helpful to keep the tension alive. In one way, it keeps the reader in the dark about the depth of Darren's discomfort, but it makes the, reason profo makes the reader profoundly aware of the lack of close relationships that this character has his own age. This ends up serving as a strong justification for Darren's future actions. Darren is a quiet, straight-laced kid who doesn't seem the type to run away from his parents, even just for the weekend. But now, knowing that his brother is perhaps the only person he can talk to, and this is someone he needs, this change of behavior is believable. And all this came from the lack of a sentence. So now, let's skip to later on when Darren is visiting his brother in college with Zoe. In an attempt to fit into his new brother's, life, brother's new lifestyle, Darren finds himself smoking a cigarette. Through Darren's thoughts on this, we see two more versatile uses of the list. The first list we have is this one. Six features of Darren's new reality that he tries to wrap his head around while sitting next to Zoe on the steps in front of Nate's building and smoking his very first cigarette ever. 1. Nate is a pot smoker and I'm a cigarette smoker, at least right now. 2. There seem to be few, if any, actual adults in Ann Arbor. 3. I'm not nearly as good at holding my cigarette as Zoe is at holding hers, probably because I'm too preoccupied with knowing when to tap the end with my thumb so the ash will fall off. Still, I feel pretty cool. Four, I'm more comfortable with Zoe than with Nate, at least right now, even though Zoe barely talks. Five, the clouds have pretty much disappeared, and it's really, really nice out, both because of the shade of blue the sky is and because Ann Arbor is just way mellower than Chicago, including somehow the suburbs. Ann Arbor is just really nice, nice as in peaceful. Six, Kyle's not annoying or mean or anything, but it would still be better if he just went away. Kyle's his brother's roommate. So in this seemingly formal format, the reader gets an intimate look into Darren's thoughts. This is his unfiltered voice, 
It includes little details that might not be significant enough to make it into a traditional prose, but nonetheless help to paint a more complex picture. We learn that one, Darren's brother has changed enough to be redefined as something, and it's such a big deal that Darren lets it define him too. Two, Darren knows deep down that they are doing questionable things, but seems to rely on or need adults to stop. Three, smoking does not come easy to Darren, but it does come easy to Zoe. Four, he likes how it comes easy to Zoe, and it only enhances his view of her. The same action, because it's not natural for his brother, distances the two of them. Five, Darren is overwhelmed, to the point that the scenery is making that much of an impact on him. Six, Darren is desperate for time with people he cares about, alone. He needs it. So what of this was gained specifically from the format? One main thing, especially in a format that seems like nothing but telling, is that this is actually a great example of show, not tell. Each of these things I inferred was not stated explicitly, but implied from a separate detail or shown in an image. We do lack some in-scene moments. What about Kyle is making Darren uncomfortable? How does he feel with Kyle around? What does the cigarette smell or taste like? And yes, it's true we're missing out on these things, but I feel both of these things would be easy list to add, so it is the author who deemed this unimportant and not the form itself. The list here is an example of the most common type throughout the book. Small exposition in the title, and then a sequence of events that follow. In contrast, sometimes the main action can take place in the list title itself. Let's take the very next page for instance. One response from Darren, which concludes a brief exchange between him and Zoe in exchange establishing that Zoe has, in fact, smoked marijuana before and probably will later today, but just didn't feel like it right now. One. Oh. Again, we have a short, almost non-existent list, but we learned so much. This is as close to dialogue as we can get within a list. You can almost hear Darren's uncertainty and desperation to sound cool, his fear of being judged. In that one syllable, you can hear what he hopes to be nonchalance for Zoe. Oh. What might a list from Zoe's mind look like? Does she really not care, or is she too, like Darren, trying to sound cooler and more confident than she is? Because this is from Darren's point of view, we don't know. But there are several ways this format could explore this that would sound, that would sound clunky in normal prose, but natural here. If the author so chose, lists are very easy ways to switch points of views rapidly and not feel too jumbled. Because the nature of the format is detached, having to read a setup every time, Zoe's and Darren's thoughts could co-mingle easily. Conversely, if you wanted to keep the point of view limited, Darren could make a list about what he thinks Zoe might be thinking about. If we were to write that whole scene out normally, having a diversion like that would feel very out of place, it would slow the story down, but it fits perfectly into this already weird story told in a series of diversions and seemingly out of time. Some lists slow down, some lists speed up. It allows the author more freedom. Overall, I think Darren's story benefits from the list both in emotional honesty and creative pacing. It functions as a camera lens that can zoom up close to a scene, to something small like one sound or a series of thoughts that don't pan out, or zoom out to bigger things like fears, memories, or pain. Our final example is back in the world of contemporary adult literature, David Levithan's The Lover's Dictionary. This is a stunningly beautiful love story told outside of chronological order and confined to short dictionary entries. This one is unique for several reasons, and perhaps the most experimental of the bunch. The two main characters are unnamed and their story bounces back and forth through time. The reader is given flashes of their lives through short vignettes and the more you read, the more the pieces come together to form a beautiful snapshot of a love story in all of its ups and downs. So let's look what this format has to offer. Like our email subject lines in our list titles, the dictionary entry also gives us some pre-information. There is a setup that tells the reader what to expect in each micro scene. Take for example this one. Composure, noun. You told me anyway, even though I didn't want to know, a stupid drunken fling while you were visiting Toby in Austin, months ago. And the thing I hate the most is knowing how much hinges on my reaction, how your unburdening can only lead to me being burdened. If I lose it now, I will lose you. I know that. I hate it. You wait for my response. This section ends on a cliffhanger of sorts. We don't get to see the narrator's response, but we know what it is. He is composed. Out of all the scenes from this relationship, this moment is the literal definition of composure. We don't need to write out the end of this moment. This allows the story to continue to be sparse, and it adds to the ephemeral tone of this piece. 
to me this section is also clever in that the part of composed so that we do get to see feels anything but. The thoughts leading up to this moment are full of pain and anger with words like stupid and hate. This buildup makes his composure feel even sadder and more defeated, and it makes the absence of this moment more poignant. Just as it is absent from the scene, this composure is not present in his true feelings. The scene would read and feel different with a new heading, with, say, unbearable. But the word truly defines the situation, even more so than the scene defining the word, as it is implied. Because the word is composure, we know he is composed. To further demonstrate this, I'm going to read you the next section without the heading. I want you to think of what kind of words could head this definition. I believe your exact words were, you're getting too emotional. So, does anyone have any ideas about what kind of word this could be? Okay, at this point I will pause maybe 60 seconds or so and take a few suggestions that I'm hoping people will give me. I have a few tucked away if I need to. And then I will move on and show them the real thing. Here we go. So our word is exacerbate. This is a big tonal color f for this moment. It implies that she sees his emotional nature as a bad thing, and that her saying this to him adds to a pain she has already made him feel. It's not just negative, but it's a compound negative. It is exacerbating what is already wrong between them. It's not a jokey moment or a learning moment. It's a sign of trouble. Okay, so we see just how important the word is in these definitions. Let's look at what more benefit of telling the story through these flashes. Take the next slide to start. Leary, adjective. Those first few weeks, after you told me, I wasn't sure we were going to make it. After working for so long on being sure of each other, sure of this thing, suddenly we were unsure again. I didn't know whether or not to touch you, sleep with you, have sex with you. Finally, I said, it's over. Again, we are informed of the mood by our word, Leary. Our speaker is hesitant to keep this relationship going, and he appears to break it off. But just a few letters down the road, we get persevere. Persevere, verb. Now notice this one's an action instead of an adjective. Persevere. Those first few weeks after you told me, I wasn't sure we were going to make it. After working for so long on being sure of each other, sure of this thing, suddenly we were unsure again. I didn't know whether or not to touch you, sleep with you, have sex with you. Finally, I said, it's over. You started to cry, and I quickly said, no, I mean this part is over. We have to get to the next part. This entry is identical to Leary, with an addendum on the end, but it changes the whole meaning, even the tone of which I read it. He didn't break up with her. He wants to persevere through their issues and try to make it work. So why include Leary at all? Why split this up with several pages between them? In a moment like this, the author is showing that there is more than one dominant emotion. Just because we know the truth of what happened in Persevere doesn't make Leary any less true. The speaker is still leery of the relationship and afraid of getting hurt. It foreshadows their inevitable breakup and makes this image of Perseverance tainted. If we saw the moment of Perseverance without the knowledge of Leary, we might feel stronger about their chances. But because we know it, this moment is haunted by the past definition, and in a way it can never truly escape it. David Levinson's dictionary format is perfect for this piece. It files away the memories of an important life experience, and because of the rigid nature of definitions, speaks with a large sense of authority. The format subtly hints at the idea that everything in this account is factual. It also allows for several, dif several different lenses to view the story. It presents a complete and whole picture that doesn't get bogged down in a linear plot. By the time you're done, you don't feel like you've watched the story unfold, but rather that you've experienced something fully and lived through it. By placing this love story in this unique container, Levithan's couple stands out from the myriad of love stories on the shelves, and it allows an ordinary love story to have vibrancy and truthfulness. There are no gimmicks or subplots within the events themselves. It's just an honest account of love from beginning to end. But not in that order. So with our remaining bit of time, I'm going to make you write. <gasps> Gasp! Writing in a writing program! <laughs> there are a million exercises I can give you, and I have plenty more for you to explore on your own in the handout. But let's do this one together, as it's more complicated, but it's really fun. So, experimental author Jeff Noon created a language metafication process called the Cobra Lingus Engine. It's also the title of the book in which he puts all of his um, things he comes up with inside. This process takes, treats text like a string of computer code, and it manipulates it through filter gates. On paper, it looks like the language is being manipulated with precise rules, 
like a computer program reacting to a virus. But actually there's a lot of freedom. Basically, you take a starter text, either something you wrote or something famous, and then introduce the filter gates to the text, imagining how this text must respond to each stimuli. If you look in your packet, you'll see a list of these filter gates and what they do. With that in front of you, let me show you an example of how this process works. For our inlet, or starter text, we will use twinkle twinkle little star, how I wonder what you are. So the first filter gate I chose was overload, which pause defined as drastically increasing the image density of a text to be used with caution. So now our starter text turned into twinkling stars that shine like thousands of mirrors turn toward the flaming torch that lights the universe. How I wonder in what locked steel vault you might be hiding in. Next I took my new text and I introduced it to the filter gate release virus which is defined as attacking the text changing words of choice into others of similar sound or rhyming. So then I ended up with blinking cars that whine like cows and dove gears burned bored the shaming porch cat writes the universe. Wow, I wonder in what talked eel malt ew kite sea biting wind. Wind. Yes, that makes no sense. And so that is why the last filter gate I introduced it to was find story, which is defined as Forcing the text into the nearest possible narrative, however nonsensical. And here's what I ended up with. Fine story. The traffic jam went on for miles, like a stampede of cattle that got stuck in a gate. Birds flew overhead as the gears overheating below and s sending puffs of smoke towards them. In an effort to escape, they flew closer to the neighboring houses where bored house cats swatted at them from their porches. In the midst of it all was our hearse. Bearing my father was already the hardest day of my life, and now it was also the longest. Others in the car attempted to talk to us, making small talk with us about a malt shop we were passing or something, or a kite flying overhead. But it never worked. If you were going to take a bet on what would distract me today, you would always lose. So hopefully, that made sense. And what you saw was something that looks like the computer example I gave before. I introduced my text to three rules. Overload, adding imagery, release virus, rhyming some of the words, and find story, bringing to a narrative as close as possible. But in reality, there were no real rules I was following, just suggestions. The beauty of this method is that you can distance yourself from the text and not worry about literary conventions or quality or whether it makes sense. Simply manipulate it until you've made something entirely new. From this thing, you can then leave your computer manipulation and explore a new idea on your own time. So with our last few minutes, I'd like you to try this on your own, We'll all use the same beginning and see where we end up. Please use one to two filter gates that you think are interesting or doable, and then finish up with find story. And then we'll share a few of what we came up with. So here's what we're all going to start with. I am not afraid of storms, for I am learning how to steer my ship. I'll give you about three minutes, and I will be able to answer questions all throughout. Okay, so then I will give them... Ooh, I know I've got two minutes. I might have to cut something. And then... Hopefully one or two people will share. Hopefully people will understand. I really am curious to see, Beth, whether or not you understand. Because I can give an easier example at the end if necessary. I just really, really like this one. I've had so much fun with it for years and I'm getting better at it. And I hope with the handout in front of you, you understood what I said. Okay, so they're writing. And I'm answering questions. And then we had a brief discussion and it took about three and a half minutes total. And then I finish up with this. Well, great job, everyone. I hope you got a good look into fun ways to play with language and experimental spaces for your stories, and I hope I encourage you to read more experimental fiction in the future. Uh, if you have any other questions about this, feel free to find me at residency or ask to borrow one of my books. Uh, thank you all and have a good day.